Now let's apply all this to our robot. Well, first of all, we need a motion model. But as you remember, in unit A, we already set up the motion model for our robot. There's the track width, W, and there's some left and right movement of the tracks. And by that, the robot will move on a curved segment with the radius R, and after moving, it will have changed its orientation by an angle of alpha. And so we obtained the following equations. So alpha was R minus L divided by the width of the robot, and R, the radius, was L divided by alpha, which only works for R not equal L. And so for this case, we obtained the new state, that is the old state, plus R plus half of the width times the sine of theta plus alpha minus the sine of theta and a similar expression for the second component and for the third component we just add alpha to the heading. So and as you see this is just a function of our old state and alpha and r. But alpha and r are ultimately computed from l and r. And so you see this is the state and this is the control. So we can write this equation in the form x prime is a function of x and u. And just for completeness, if r equals l, then we have the situation that the robot is just moving on in the direction of its heading. So this down here is zero, because if L and R are the same, then the heading does not change. And also this is L, but you could as well use R, because in this case R equals L. So now I implemented this function for you. So in the downloads for this unit, you will find this slam 7 a extended Kalman filter class. And this starts a new class, which is called extended Kalman filter. And we will learn shortly why it's called extended. And so this is the function g, which we just introduced. So it gets the state, which contains the x, y, and theta, and it gets the control, which is left and right movement. And then if those two are different, then here is the computation that we just had on the previous slide. So it computes alpha, the radius, r, and then computes the three components, which are called g123 here. The only speciality being that the theta plus alpha is normalized to a range between minus pi and plus pi. So this is obtained by adding pi, then doing a model load division by 2 pi, and then subtracting pi again. And so for the other case, the robot doesn't turn, and we use those equations, which just move in the direction of the heading and leave the theta as it is. And so here you see a new construct, which is called array. Now, since we have to deal with vectors and matrices now, we import the numerical Python. So this contains classes for handling matrices and vectors. So in the end, we take these three scalar values, which have been computed either here or there, and construct a new array by putting g1, 2, and 3 into a list and calling this array constructor, which converts this list into an array of floats. And now in the main function, there are some constants for our robot, and these should be familiar. So this is the conversion factor of motor ticks to millimeters. That is the drag width of the robot. And this is the scanner displacement, which we'll need only for the output. And then we start with our measured starting position, which is x, y, that's the upper right corner of our arena, and a certain heading. And we put that also into an array. We read the log file, and then here, this is the main loop, and it is very, very simple. We read the motor ticks from the log file, convert them to an array, and multiply the array with ticks to millimeters, so that left and right are multiplied. And then we just call our function above, the extended Kalman filter, g, the function of state, control, and using additional variables, in this case, only the robot width. And so we get a new state, and we just append all the states to a list. And then in the end, we output all the states. But now remember, the states are actually the center of our robot, but we used to track the laser scanner, which is displaced by this scanner displacement. And so right down here where we output the position, we modify the position so that we output the position of the laser scanner head instead of the center of the robot. And this is just to be compatible with our previous handling of the point that is tracked by our overhead camera. Now let's run this. Now after we run this, it will produce a file called statesfromtext.txt. Now if we open this, we will see our familiar curve. We may load additional data like the landmarks, so we can clearly see the trajectory is smooth but not correct, or the robot's reference. So this should look familiar, because it is exactly the same algorithm that we had in unit A. Now let's see how we can combine this with our common filter. And I'll write down the equation once again. So and this was the equation for the transition of the state. And due to this transition, we obtained those two equations, which together are the prediction step of the Kalman filter. And now as you see, this 
is linear. So the transition of the else state uses a linear multiplication by a matrix and the control is also multiplied by a matrix. However, in our description of our robot, we found out that xt is some function of xt minus 1 and ut and we saw that this function has variables in the denominator and also has sine and cosine function, so it's nonlinear. And so one way to proceed would be to linearize this function so that we obtain this and then we can use this in a Kalman filtering. And this is indeed the standard Kalman filter. Now we will have a look at what is called the extended Kalman filter. So instead of linearizing this, we use the nonlinear function to compute the prediction of our new state. So in the same manner as we moved here from our transition equation to the equation that computed the predicted state from the old state using just a replacement of x t minus 1 by mu t minus 1, we now move here from our nonlinear equation that uses x t minus 1 and u to the prediction equation that uses mu t minus 1 and u. So we proceed in exactly the same manner. And then for the predicted covariance, we do the following. Now we do not have this A matrix anymore because we replaced that by a nonlinear function. And so what we have to put in here is the Jacobian matrix of G. So it is all derivatives of G with respect to all variables in the state, or we could also write this as all partial derivatives of G with respect to the state. And this matrix is computed at mu t minus one and u t. So this is the prediction step of the extended Kalman filter. And to give an example, so if our state is x, y, and theta, then the matrix G would be the partial derivative of the first component of G with respect to x, with respect to y, and with respect to theta. And we would do this for all three components of our function G. So this is the Jacobian matrix of G in case our three-dimensional state is x, y, and theta. Now let us figure out G. So in our case, we had G of x, y, theta, L and R, which was given by x, y, theta, plus these terms. And so this is G1, G2, and G3. So we have the partial derivative of G1 with respect to x. And that's easy because there's no x in this part behind here. It's just here, so that's one. And then the partial derivative of the first component with respect to y. Well, in the first component, there is no y at all, so it's zero. And it's more complicated for theta. So there's no theta in this part, so that's just a constant term. But there's theta in here and here, so you have to form the derivative of those two terms. So the derivative of the sine is the cosine. And so we have this. Now the second component, we have no x in the second component, so that's zero. We have a y. And for the derivative with respect to theta, we obtain this. And so for the third component, that is just theta plus alpha. So the derivatives with respect to x and y are zero, and with respect to theta, it is one. So these are the nine elements of our matrix G. Now there's one problem with those formulas, because here there's the expression r plus w half, but r is l divided by alpha. And so if r equals l, alpha is zero, and we would have a division by zero when computing this. So we need to think about the case r equals l as well. Let's have a look at this component here. Let me rewrite this component. Now let's think about what happens if alpha goes to zero. Now we multiply this out and obtain now if alpha goes to zero, then this goes to cosine of theta minus cosine of theta. So this will go to zero. Multiplied with a constant factor, the entire term will go to zero. Now here it is a little bit more complicated because this will go to zero. But this, as we saw, is L divided by alpha. So this will go to infinity. And so we need to have a closer look. So this is L times and we're interested in the limit when alpha goes to zero. Now we use the rule of L'Hopital, a French mathematician, who found out that we can't find this limit by forming the derivative in the numerator and the denominator. So we have the derivative with respect to alpha down here, that's one. And the derivative in the numerator, that is minus sine of theta plus alpha. And the derivative with respect to alpha of this term is zero. So what remains is minus L times sine of theta. And so similarly, we can do the second term. And so overall, for the case r equals l, we obtain that g equals 1, 1, 1 on the main diagonal, then minus l sine of theta. This is the term we just derived on the last slide, and l times the cosine of theta. So now we obtain g, which is the derivative of g with respect to the state for both cases. For r equals l, it's this, and for r not equal to l, see two slides ago. So now we can program this.
So I prepared this code for you. If you want to do it offline, it is slam 7b state derivative question. And this is the code we had previously. So in our extended Kalman filter, this is the G that computes the prediction from an old state and the control. And here, this is the function you'll have to implement. So this is all derivatives of G with respect to all variables in the state. And so as we saw, this will result in a three times three matrix. And in order to show you how to construct this, I've put here this array constructor, which constructs a 3 times 3 matrix just with the elements 1, 2, 3 in the first row, 4, 5, 6 in the second row and 7, 8, 9 in the third row. And so you're doing so by putting every row into a list and making a list of all rows and then giving that list to the array constructor. So you will need the theta, which is the third component. So counting from zero, it's index number two of the state. And you will need left and right, which is the two components of the control. And you'll need to distinguish those two cases if R is not equal to L, so the robot makes a turn, or if R equals L, well, the robot goes straight. And so in order to find out if your solution is correct, the main function down here does the numeric derivative of g and compares this to your analytic derivative. So here we define a small delta and call the original function g with the state modified in x by this delta, with the state modified in y and modified in theta, and we divide this by delta. So this gives us the difference quotients, which are, if delta is small enough, close to the differential quotient, which you are computing down here. And so in the end, we output the difference quotient, which is called the numerical derivative, the differential quotient, which is what you compute, the difference between the two, and then we call a function from numerical Python, which tests if all the values in these two matrices are similar. And so if you run this, you should ideally see something like that. So this is the result of the difference quotient. This is your result of the differential quotient. And you see the one on the main diagonal and here the derivatives with respect to theta. And you see the difference is very small. And so the final test tells you it seems to be correct because the values in this matrix are very small. Now before you start, let me explain briefly this trick with the difference quotient. So, for example, we are interested in the partial derivative of g1 with respect to x. And so, as you know from differential calculus, this is the limit of g1 of x plus delta y and theta minus g1 of x, y and theta divided by delta. And so what the main function does is that it computes this difference quotient for very small delta, like 10 raised to the power of minus 7. And then it prints out this value and also prints out this value, which results from your analysis analytic differentiation of g1 with respect to x, and then it prints out those two values and checks if they are approximately the same. So now let's program this. 